Supernatural with Sid Roth. What happens when an ultra-Orthodox Jewish woman thinks for herself and finds hidden messages in the Torah that prove Jesus is the Messiah? Find out why she publicly rebuked a leading rabbi about Jesus on this edition of It's Supernatural! If it's not natural, consider it's supernatural. My guest today is a woman that comes from a traditional Jewish background. The last thing in the world she would think as she studied her own Tanakh, her own Torah, her own Jewish scriptures, is she found out on her own. Man did not help her a secret message in the first book of the Torah that absolutely proves that Yeshua, that's Hebrew for Jesus, is the Jewish Messiah. Sharon Allen, so the Mishpacha can get to know you a little bit. Yeah. Tell me a bit about your background. You were raised in New York City. Yes, I was born in New York, I don't raised hear in New, New York. I don't hear a New York accent. I live in California now. Oh, you and got the California raisins now. Maybe, maybe. <laughs> And I was raised in a Jewish Orthodox home uh, with a love for Yiddishkeit. And for we, those that don't understand, what is Yiddishkeit? Jewish life, a Jewish lifestyle, Jewish things. We observed mitzvah Torah. We observed the mitzvot that the rabbis taught. And to us, it was our way of showing our love and devotion to God. We went to synagogue. Of course, I went to cheder. I went to Jewish school as a child and grew up with a love for my Jewish heritage. And that was what I was comfortable with always. Now, I know you, you, you moved to California, Irvine, yes. and you were involved in yes. uh, uh, the Chabad house in a synagogue. Tell me about that. Yes. Um, my husband and I helped build the Chabad of Irvine Jewish Center, which was just starting out. Irvine was a new community, and it was a new Orthodox synagogue, uh, Chabad. And um, we felt that this is where we belonged. These, these were our people, and of course, I would always uh, belong to an Orthodox synagogue. And if someone had grabbed you by the neck as a young girl in Brooklyn or New York, and grabbed you by the collar and said, believe in Jesus or you go to hell, I'd you would have said... I'd run the other way. I'd run the other direction because I was so positive that, uh, that Jesus is for, for the Goyim. And I was so glad that Jesus came and gave the Goyim a good code of ethics because that's what I would tell them. But for us Jews, we had the Bible, the Tanakh, and that's all that we needed. How in the world, reading the Torah, the book of Genesis, did you find this secret message that is, I mean, it's earth shattering. Yes. How? Yes. Well, you know, every Jewish person believes that they know what's in their Bible. We go to Jewish school when we're young, and then as adults, we go to the synagogue, and we hear a Torah portion, and we hear a Haf Torah portion mm -hmm. from the prophets, and we really believe we know what's in our Bible. And when I started studying, I sat down, I started at page one, and I went and turned each page, read it completely. When I came to the first genealogy, which is Genesis 5. The, the fifth chapter of Genesis. Yes. I read every name. I didn't want to miss anything. I knew that the Hebrew names mean something. Every Hebrew name has the Hebrew root within it, the root word within the Hebrew name. And when I studied and researched the root Hebrew names, the roots of the mm -hmm. Hebrew names, I, there was a message there. I realized that every word. Every Hebrew word in the Bible means something. It's a message to us. It's God's way of giving us his message, his instruction for our did lives. You, did you have any idea you would find what you found? No, absolutely it, 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 not. It's like um, searching for buried treasure, but you, you kind of you, you knew you'd find something. Yes. Did you, any idea would be so powerful what you would find? I, I knew, I always knew that everything that God wanted us Jews to know about his Messiah would be in my Jewish Bible. So I expected to read about my Messiah. 
and come, with a, come away with a picture, a clear picture of who the Messiah is so that we Jews would recognize him when he would come. So, tell me. <laughs> I've been a Jewish way. Tell me. <laughs> In my Jewish Bible, I found where he would be born, how he would live his life, what he would accomplish in his lifetime, what he would do, how he would die. All of these things are in my Jewish Bible. And when I came to the genealogy and studied... I, I have to ask you a personal question. Yes, of course. Some Christians show you these things. No. Some Christian kind of say, look, it's right here. You ignorant Jewish person, you... It was something within me as I was reading, it was as if God was, was unfolding a scroll and showing me what he wanted me to see. So tell me what you found in Genesis, in Genesis the fifth chapter. Okay. Um, the, the sentence that evolved with doing the research of each name, the sentence says, Mankind turns their faces towards and are appointed mortal grievous sorrow. So far, so true. Mankind has grievous, mor is mortal, and has sorrow. In other words, that is the English translation of the first ten Hebrew names that were found in the Bible. And it continues. Okay. God, who is praised, comes down to instruct and to consecrate. Wait a second. God comes down? Yes. God is going to instruct us? Yes, yes. You know, I didn't take anything for granted. I used three different Hebrew and Aramaic lexicons so that when my research was completed, no one could say to me, Sharon, you did it of yourself. Mm -hmm. Because I could show them in these three different Hebrew lexicons the full examinations was there the more Hebrew to that name. message? Yes. Oh, what more did it say? God who is praised comes down to instruct and to consecrate. He is sent forth as a prophet priest to be smitten and scourged, to die, to give rest and security. That sounds like Jesus. Yes. The part where it talks about a prophet priest was from the Encyclopedia Judaica on the name Lamech, which they did not have a complete history of, but they knew that it was from an ancient name, and that was what the name stood for. It was from the Encyclopedia Judaica. Please, would you read that hidden message in its entirety again? Mankind turns their faces towards and are appointed mortal grievous sorrow to lament and to mourn. God, who is praised, comes down to instruct and to consecrate. He is sent forth as a prophet priest to be smitten and scourged, to die, to give rest and security. Wow. If you want to see how she broke those first ten names in the Hebrew scriptures down, translated them, and came up with this message, we'll show you. Don't go away. Be right back. In a moment, find out how Sharon set out to prove Jesus was not the Jewish Messiah. So, this traditional Orthodox Jewish woman decided to think for herself, Sharon Allen. She starts examining the Tanakh, the Jewish scriptures, takes a look at each name as is revealed in the book of Genesis, the first name mentioned, the second, the third, the fourth, and they're all Hebrew names. Somehow she knew within that these names had great meaning because they came from God. And when she translated each Hebrew name in order, I might add, those ten names she found a secret message for the world from God. What I would like you to do, Sharon Allen, is mention the names in their order as found in the Jewish scriptures. Uh, it's in Genesis, the fifth chapter, yes. and, and mention each name and then mention the English translation. Yes. The first name is Adam, which means man or men, can mean mankind, people, or human beings. The second name is Seth, means appoint 
or to turn the face towards. Enosh, mortal, grievous, or sorrow. Kainen means to lament, to mourn. Mahalel, which means God who is praised. Yared, which means to descend or to come down as in a theophany. Enoch, which means to instruct, to teach, to dedicate, or to consecrate. Methuselah, which means to be sent forth as a prophet, to die by violence or naturally, and then be sent forth as a shoot or a sprout. Lamech, according to the Encyclopedia Judaica, the origin meaning of the name is not clear, but appears in Old Akkadian as a noun, which means a special group of priests. Also, the root in Hebrew can mean both to beat or to strike. It can also mean to smite, to smite, smitten, or scourged. Mm. Noah. This is good, Sharon. <laughs> Go ahead. I'm it's sorry. exciting. It it's really ex is. It is exciting. I mean, and uh, here I am researching this, going page by page it, and looking in my research book because something inside me knew the Hebrew is such a unique language. God knew what he was doing when he chose Hebrew to give us the I Bible. I think God put this in for Jewish people. Yes, like think, me. <laughs> yes, for religious Jewish people. Yes. Noah, to give rest or security. Read the sentence again now. In its entirety, this is the English translation of the first ten names found in the first book of the Torah, Genesis, the fifth chapter. Mankind turns their faces towards and are appointed mortal grievous sorrow to lament and to mourn. God, who is praised, comes down to instruct and to consecrate. He is sent forth as a prophet priest, to be smitten and scourged, to die, to give rest and security. You are part of the Lubavitcher movement. You are a traditional Jew. You help build the synagogue. You help build the Chabad house. You love your people. You love your Yiddishkeit. Yeah. You love everything about Judaism. Yes. And you reach a point where you're uh, you were divorced from a Jewish man, yes. had a child. Yes. You've remarried a wonderful Gentile man that loves God, loves yes. Yiddishkeit. Yes. Everything is fine. So it's time for him to convert. Yes. And he goes along with everything except the very last requirement, which yes. was? To renounce whatever the person believed in before. That you have to appear before a bet din, council of rabbis, mm -hmm. a rabbinical court, and they have to renounce whatever they believed in before. In our home, we never discussed Jesus or church or Christianity. Uh, my husband, years earlier, had said, you know, he was a Protestant. So I said to him, well, I guess because, you know, you're, you're Protestant, so I guess it's Jesus. You know, I just, mm -hmm. off the top of my head, just like that. And I said, well, I guess you'll renounce Jesus. And in a quiet voice, he said, I don't think I can do that. Wait a second. Was he going to church? No. Our well, home was Was he used... reading the Bible? No. How much no. did he love Jewishness? Our whole home was filled with Yiddish So why wouldn't he we renounce Jesus? We were living Jesus? a Jewish life. Why wouldn't he renounce Jesus for the unity when, in the family? Why? When he was a young man, he had a church experience. He was in a church, and he accepted the Lord at that time. And then, of course, he went to school and graduated, went on to business, and became successful in business. And business became his religion until we met. And then, um, uh, you know, my mother would say, he's so Hamisha. He has mm -hmm. these wonderful ways about him. So he Jewish. loved being in our synagogue, and he loved living our Jewish life. Our home was used for Jewish outreach. So why didn't he renounce Jesus for you? He said in that quiet voice, I don't think I can do that. And I became hysterical. I said, what do you mean you can't renounce Jesus? You're a successful businessman. How, our home is used for Jewish outreach. How in the world can you believe in something that's so pagan? It's like Roman mythology. Sid, it was a terrible morning, let me tell you. I'm sure. I was hysterical. And then, in the midst of all this horror, 
a thought came to me. I'll just go downstairs to the family room, I'll take down my Jewish Bible, and I'll start to read the Jewish Bible. And I didn't think, I didn't think it'd take me long. I'd just start to read page by page, and pretty soon I'd be able to show my husband the exact scriptures that would prove that this Jesus could never have been the fulfillment of the Jewish Bible. And so that's what I did. So what did you find? I found Jesus in my Jewish Bible. Oh, but you probably didn't read the Jewish commentaries and the Talmud and the Midrash and all these wonderful <laughs> Jewish books that we have. Well, the rabbis say that you can't understand the Bible without the commentaries. So I bought the Sonsino commentaries, the Art Scroll Tanakh series publications commentaries, Rashi's commentaries, and I kept reading and reading and reading in the hopes that I would get a clue, a key, that would explain why I was reading about my Messiah in the Jewish Bible, and it sounded so much like the Goyesha Jesus that you everybody hears about when you're in America. I, that's, that was it. And so I went to the Jewish bookstore and kept buying books upon books upon books. I bought um, the anti-missionary books uh, with such titles. Oh, you saw those as, things and yes. you still believe in Jesus? Yes, I bought books with such titles as You Take Jesus, I'll Take God. Uh, uh, a Jewish, uh, Jewish good for nothing. It's just, uh, you wouldn't believe these. Jewish good for nothing? Yeah. Hey, uh, we'll take a break and we'll be right back after that. Stay tuned as Sharon describes how deep programmers tried to talk her out of her discoveries. But first, this. You thought Jesus was Roman mythology, but you not only studied the Word of God, you not only studied all the Jewish writings, but you also talked to people that are trained to talk yes. you out of your faith. Did any of this jolt your belief in Jesus? No, um, because when I would question the rabbis that I spoke to about certain scriptures that were in the Bible, and uh, you know, the ancient, the ancient rabbis, they recognized two pictures of the Messiah in the Bible. They even had names for the two pictures of the two different what Messiahs. Were they? Mashiach ben David, who would come as a suffering servant, mm -hmm. and Mashiach um, ben David. Uh, Mashiach ben Joseph, who would come as a suffering servant, Mashiach ben David, who would come as the conquering hero. And so in reading these historical uh, texts, I realized that I wasn't the only one that was seeing these two different pictures of the Messiah. It, it's almost as if before the Messiah came, there was one type of Jewish thought, and yes. after the Messiah came, because yes. Jewish people did not want to believe in that man, yes. they almost uh, rewrote history. Well, in talking to my rabbis, I would explain to them Isaiah 49, where we can hear the suffering servant, the Messiah, lamenting to God how he failed to bring back the 12 tribes of Israel. And then we hear God comforting the Messiah, the suffering servant, and he says, it's too light a thing for me to give you to the 12 tribes of Israel only. I will give you to all the nations of the world. And the word nations in Hebrew is goyim, Gentile. And I had to stop and think, now wait, when did we Jews miss the Messiah and suddenly it went to the goyim? Right. And so I called uh, my rabbi, Mendel and his wife Rachel, I invited them to my home and told them, I showed them all my books and uh, they said not to worry, they had an expert and uh, they sent uh, a deprogrammer, a rabbi who is mm -hmm. specialized in this area and then after uh, many, many hours of studying with him, I could see he was coming from a very modern approach and mm -hmm. here I'm coming from a very traditional approach of after course. reading all of this and uh, then I um, had phone conversations uh, with Gerald Siegel, who is an author of a book, uh, The uh, Jewish Response to Christian mm -hmm. Missionaries. And then at my daughter's Hebrew school, um, at Hebrew Academy, a very world-renowned, very well-known rabbi uh, came to speak. He's a specialist, uh, again, yes. in telling Jewish people not to believe in Jesus. Yes, yes. Oh, we Jewish people have so many specialists. Yes. <laughs> and, uh, and for most of the evening, 
uh, he and I spoke and we discussed uh, Jewish history and uh, Jewish customs, Jewish traditions, and the Messiah. And each time I was coming from a traditional, an Orthodox traditional mm -hmm. approach, and he was coming from a very modern, uh, something that I hadn't been reading in all of these ancient books that I was reading, uh, not even in uh, the, Mishnah, uh, the Mishnah Rabbah and the Talmud, where it discusses certain traditions and what would happen when the Messiah would come. Uh, the rabbis have a whole new modern approach to it. And so uh, at the end of the evening, um, I, I went away knowing positively that uh, Jesus is my Jewish Messiah. And um, I had no doubts. I had no more fears. The, the rabbi was so anxious to bring the meeting to a close that uh, he actually, he said, oh, you know, Jesus committed blasphemy from the cross. And I was shocked. I didn't even know what he was talking about. And he said, oh, yes, when uh, Jesus said, uh, and of course, the rabbi used a very robust, ugly voice. And he said, um, Oh, yes, when Jesus was on the cross, he said, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And he said it in a, like he was walking away from God. And I explained to him in, in the front of all, the, all these people, I said, No, I said, there's so many ways he could say it. He could say it pleading or lovingly. It doesn't mean to say it in that voice. And, um, and then, uh, of course, we know that those words, those very same words, were said by our own beloved King David in Psalms. So how and could what Jew would possibly think that our King David would commit blasphemy? And that was the end of the evening. I went home after well, how that. Could, how could a rabbi make such a statement ag I against King David? The only thing I could say is that he was so terribly anxious to bring the meeting to a close that he was willing to say anything without realizing he just... Uh, he, he probably dismissed uh, you also as someone that doesn't even keep a Jewish lifestyle. Yes, yes. I, I suppose that he did. And it was interesting because, you know, he was talking to the group of people and they were very concerned about the missionaries talking to their, to their children. And he kept saying, uh, you don't have to worry. You know, as long as you have a Jewish home, uh, your children are safe. And then the next person would say, oh, yes, but the missionaries are having a schooling with their children and they're bringing home scriptures we'd never heard before. And then the rabbi would again say, no, you don't have to worry. You have a Jewish home. Send them to a school like this, you know, Hebrew Academy, mm -hmm. which is where he was speaking, where my daughter was attending. And, and you wouldn't <laughs> have to worry about them. And then at that point, I just felt he was talking to me because he said, no one who knows Yiddishkeit, who knows Jewish things, who knows the Bible, who knows their Jewish heritage, ever turns to that man. And of course, because Orthodox Jewish people don't say the name of Jesus, so he said that man. And I thought he was talking to me. And I was sitting there right in the first row, because this is my daughter's school. And I was sitting there in the first row, and I had my husband on one side and my daughter on the other side. And I squeezed my husband's hand, and I said, do you think I should say something? And my husband said, yes. And I squeezed my daughter's hand and I said, Elisa, do you think I should say something? And she said, yes, mommy, I think you should. And so I raised my hand and I said, Rabbi, what do you tell someone like me? I am a Jewish woman. I have a Jewish home. I know Yiddishkeit. And yet when I read my Jewish Bible, I see that man. And from that moment until the end of the evening, which was maybe until midnight, he and I were in direct uh, debate. As I said, with, do you know? Uh, do you know? Do you, Sharon Allen, know yeah. that man and what is his name? Yeshua Hamashiach, Jesus the Messiah. Is he very I have no Jewish? doubt. I oh, is he very Jewish? Absolutely, absolutely. He is my Jewish Messiah. He is everyone's Jewish Messiah. I have no doubt. No doubt. What no is doubt. more important than Sharon Allen having no doubt? What is more important than Sid Roth having no doubt? is will you think for yourself or will you follow revisionist theories on Judaism? I suggest that you get my book, They Thought for Themselves, and read 10 vibrant Jewish stories. Jewish people were chutzpah, what I call true Jews. A true Jew is someone that knows God and makes him known. A true Jew is someone that has shalom and peace in their heart. A true Jew is what God wants you to be. I urge you, whether you're Jewish or not Jewish, to become a believer in God in the only way 
There is no other name given unto men in which we must have our sins remitted than the name of Yeshua, Jesus, the Messiah. And I ask you to pray to God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and say, God, tell me the truth about Yeshua. And in the day that you seek him with all of your heart, in that day, he will be found, just like I found him, just like Sharon and millions of others have.